Uh, great, good, thank you. Okay, it's time to start, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for your attendance. Thank you for your interaction during all the workshops. Uh, today's workshop, as you can see on the screen, is going to be about sentence patterns in academic writing. The workshop is going to be presented by our outstanding expert and writing specialist, Dr. Sumayya Hussein. Uh, most of you know Dr. Sumaya very well. Dr. Sumaya is a language instructor at the English Language Institute and in some other colleges sometimes. Uh, she is a Cambridge certified teacher, trainer, and a member of the curriculum and test or testing development section. She has a postgraduate certificate, Trinity certificate, and an MA in TESOL. Dr. Samaya also has the University of Harvard Certificate in Differentiated Language Instruction and Inclusiveness in Learning. Additionally, Dr. Samaya was awarded various professional certificates in language teaching and learning and further education teaching from high reputed and recognized UK institutions. She is equally empowered with advanced understanding in standardized and highly ethical language teaching and facilitation of students learning. As a PhD candidate, uh, she, she could, <laughs> she might have finished, I'm not sure about this. Uh, as a PhD candidate with a focus on academic writing, Dr. Sumaya aspires to empower her students with the essential skills in this spectrum. Uh, according to her par uh, participation and contributions to the English Language uh, Academic Writing Center, uh, Dr. Samaya, uh, mashallah, presented a lot of workshops in uh, vocabulary for academic writing, writing concisely and avoiding wordiness, writing an effective argument for research for graduate students, tips for teaching academic writing for beginners, common challenges in academic writing, teaching writing in large classes, and finally, as you can see, she is going to present about sentence patterns in academic writing. The floor is yours. Enjoy it. Okay, assalamu alaikum. Thank you so much for your uh, introduction, uh, Ms. Kamal. And no, I have not finished my PhD yet, but about to finish very soon. So please do for me. Please. I hope, Thank but you. inshallah. Inshallah. But, uh, but uh, a lot of people honor me with the title of a doctor, and which I makes me feel very privileged thank you so much okay so uh, thank you everybody for being here tonight and i hope um, you will find this session um, both informative and insightful uh, in some way or another um, obviously it's not going to be one way um, session um, i will be looking forward to your own contribution uh, contributions inshallah I'll, I'll have my eye on the chat box for your comments and and, and reflections so uh, what we're going to do tonight is we're going to see, we're going to look at the reasons um, that make explicit learning or teaching of sentence patterns uh, helpful to our learners or students. And uh, we are also going to look at the structure of the sentence in English and how that makes it different from um, Arabic as um, our student's first language. Uh, we're going to have a focus, of course, at, uh, um, on the patterns of uh, uh, the sentences. And we're going to, as teachers, as teachers, we're going to look at the reasons why our learners uh, make mistakes when it comes to sentence patterns. Um, I'm going to suggest some, uh, actually few, uh, instructional strategies that can help us as teachers and may help our learners um, uh, in this particular um, area. Uh, there is a task uh, for all of us to, uh, to do, and, and it's just an activity. And at the end, I'm going to um, also um, uh, share some reflections with you. And of course, get some some questions and, and be uh, hopefully be able to answer these questions. Okay, so my question to you is, um, what makes um, this is a question to the uh, um, academic writing teachers? What makes explicit teaching of um, sentence patterns helpful? How can sent teaching sentence patterns uh, help our learners in the writing? 
do you think? I mean, how can, if we have like a, a focus, lessons on teaching sentence patterns in our classes, how do you think that can facilitate the learning and help them master um, writing different sentence, sentence patterns? I'm talking about explicit teaching, which means we assign certain uh, lessons for that. Okay, the ideas I have is um, teaching sentence patterns can sort of create variety in the students' uh, writing. So the students are not going to stick to one type of uh, pattern. Salim. Yes, it will raise awareness about the variety uh, and of, of the ways in which sentences can be constructed. That's true. Yes, variety is the word, actually. That's right. That's right. Yes, I agree with that. Um, yeah, the students will not will not uh, stick to just one type of uh, of pattern or, or, or type of sentence. They'll be able to variate um, and move around the different patterns. Okay. Um, my, my voice is not clear. Rida is Somebody saying my voice is not clear. Can you all hear me well? That's right. Yeah, Jude says um, it may help. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jude says it may help, yes, um, um, for the ideas to be more organized. And that is right. That is true. That's right. Because the structure of the sentence in English is really something that's really important for the meaning to be conveyed that that is that is true that's true yeah so the students will will be able to sort of variate their writing not st not stick to just one single type and pattern of writing uh, sentences but they can vary it depending on the meaning they want to convey and communicate to the reader that is one reason and another thing is the students will be able to correct their own mistakes if they have an awareness, um, that's true. That's very true. Yes, Rita. Yes. So if they have an awareness and they have this knowledge of the different sentence patterns, then if they make a mistake in their own writing, they will be able to self-correct their own mistakes and monitor their own writing. That's right. And in this uh, way, in this particular way, they'll be able to sort of practice a very important writing skill, which is proofreading and self-correction yeah so um and that makes it makes them autonomous uh, to some extent yeah so they will be able to correct their own mistakes and improve their own writing and advance their own writing ability um another reason i thought of is their own reading comprehension may improve because they have an idea of how the sentences are constructed and there are different types of sentences so the uh, be able to follow um, ideas and decipher uh, writers ideas and be able to understand uh, better reading contexts yeah I don't know if I've got uh, more reasons but these are the ones I thought of um, if we have to SP sentence patterns sentence patterns so I should have made that clear sorry yeah and of course yes Alim yes I agree with you it will improve the confidence in writing in, in writing sentences and constructing sentences definitely and I do agree with you to a, a great extent because um, most of the time we, we see the students shy away from writing because they think of it as a very challenging um, task to do and, and it is true actually writing involves a lot of things it involves creating ideas thinking of ideas organizing ideas thinking of the sentences to uh, express those ideas yeah and um, um, writing these sentences in a correct way so that it serves they serve the meaning intended yeah so um, okay so the structure of the sentence in English is um, refers to the order of the words in in which the you know in which we put in in a sentence and in english the order of the words in a sentence the order itself is something that is very extremely important uh, number one because a lot of students make mistakes about it and number two because it does help convey and communicate the meaning intended uh, so the order of the sentence is very important uh, we have to have a subject first, and then after that, we have to have a verb. Uh, many students do confuse that, probably because of interference from first language. But the order of the words in 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 a sentence in English is something is something that's really vital and important. 
very, very important. And also, um, as we said, it does serve the meaning intended and communicates the ideas that the writer um, plans to communicate. Yeah, so the structure of the sentence in English language is something that's really, really important. And it has to be, and I think in my point of view as a teacher of um, academic writing and a teacher of English as a foreign language, I think that is something that we have to, I, I, I myself have to put some effort into teaching my students in, in, in an <clears throat> overt way, in an explicit and overt way. Uh, Okay, so, um, right, so let's come to the sentence patterns and, 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 and as teachers and students we can share our ideas when it comes to talking about the sentence patterns. The first type of course is a simple sentence and I guess many of us will have um, an idea about what a simple sentence is. Simple sentence as the name identifies, it, it communicates one thought, one single idea. It communicates one single idea. It has a subject and a verb for this idea to be communicated well and clearly. And sometimes the verb is intransitive, uh, like we danced all night. And sometimes the verb is intransitive. We played the piano. Yeah, so that's a simple sentence. Simple sentence is simple. One verb, one, uh, su one subject, one verb, and one idea. Yeah, um, uh, our students uh, make mistakes about writing simple sentences because obviously they get carried away. They get carried away with their own ideas. They want to express more than one idea in their sentences. And that creates like a lot of problems like run on sentences, fragmented sentences, etc., etc. But if they have the structure right and clear in their heads, yeah, if they have the, the structure right and clear in their heads, I guess they will make a conscious effort to write simple sentences and communicate their um, ideas in simple sentences. Yeah, Rita is saying there are five rules for a simple sentence. And if you can in, enlighten us on that, please, Rita, you can share um, these five rules. And sometimes I feel like students have to um, be taught, um, um, like parts of speech. I mean, they have to, to be taught the, 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 the technical terms themselves. I mean, if I'm teaching a simple sentence, I will capitalization. That's true. That's true. Well done. Yes. So I feel like the students should know what a transitive verb is and what an intransitive verb is. That's right. That's right. Yes. A subject that is followed by a verb. And sometimes, yes, so a subject plus a predicate, as we say. What's the meaning of intransitive? Okay, so let's talk more about this. An intransitive verb is a verb that doesn't need, thank you so much, Rita. An intransitive verb is a verb that does not need an object. It doesn't need an object. And it's still a full sentence. We danced all night. We danced. Subject and a verb. Yeah, and the idea is complete and full and clear. Yeah, that's an intransitive verb. Doesn't need a doesn't need an object, but a transitive verb needs an object for the meaning of the sentence to be complete and full. Yeah. So like they played, they played what? They played the piano. You're welcome. They played the piano. Yeah. So a transitive verb always needs an object to come after it. Yeah, we can. We can just stop and the, the meaning is clear and complete. Yes, we danced. Yeah, we danced. Yeah. Uh, and if we say we danced all night, that makes it more interesting because it will add, um, it will say when and it will say how and it will make it more interesting because it will tell the reader that we danced all night long, like not just we danced, but we danced all night, all night long. Okay, so that's a simple sentence. That's right. That's right. Yeah, simple sentence. And uh, the simple sentence, compound sentence. What's a compound sentence? The compound sentence has two independent clauses. What does it mean by independent clauses? Independent clauses meaning means that the, the clause stand on its own. Means the, the clause, the meaning is complete. The meaning is complete, yeah? But they come together uh, to convey two ideas and make a compound sentence. Like you have two simple sentences and put them together and join them in one sentence. That's a compound sentence. Yeah, 
So an independent clause is a clause that stands on its own. That's right. So my daughter loves cats. That's the full meaning. My daughter loves cats. Full stop. And then she adores kittens. She adores kittens. If I want to put these two sentences in one, this, these two simple sentences in one compound sentence, I would say my daughter loves cats, comma, and she adores kittens. Yeah? Two independent clauses. Each one of them has its own subject. Each one of them has its own verb. It's a compound sentence. That's right. Uh, and learning a foreign language is good. Equal way, that's right, Salim. Learning a foreign language is good, but it can take a long time. But it can take a long time. Yeah. So learning a foreign language is good. That's a sentence. That's a simple sentence. That's an independent clause on its own. It conveys a complete full meaning. Yeah. And it, it conveys a, a, an idea. It expresses a thought. And learning foreign languages take a long time. That's another sentence on its own that has a full, complete idea. If I put them both in one single sentence, I will have to join the sentences with but because obviously, um, because obviously the meaning at the beginning is different from the meaning at the end of the sentence, of the compound sentence. So learning a foreign language is good, but it take a long time we have to be careful about punctuation and put a comma before but and and in compound sentences yeah so that's a compound sentence and um, if i want to communicate that's true yeah fan boys that's uh, yeah i agree with you muhammad yes fan boys yes yeah so if i um uh, why do we need compound sentences However, although, yes, all these connecting words, that's right, Abrar, yes, yes, all these connecting words, but we should, we should always put a comma before the connecting word in compound sentences. Yeah? Okay. That's right. That's right. Okay. So, so far, so good. These are compound sentences that two independent clauses that join together by a connecting word, and, and we have to have a comma before the connecting word. Yeah. Okay. Moving on. Moving on. Right. Okay. So how do we join? How do we join independent clauses in compound sentences? How do we join them? We use a comma as one of the ways. Books make good friends. Full, uh, sorry, comma. But they can sometimes be expensive. Yeah. Books make good friends, but they can sometimes be expensive. Using a comma to join. Um, uh, the two independent clauses in a compound sentence. Sometimes we use a semicolon. My mother makes the best cakes. That's a semicolon. Sorry. And people love eating them. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's a semicolon. That's what I meant. Yeah. So my mother makes the best cakes. People love eating them. Okay, so that is combining, combining uh, both parts of the sentence with a semicolon. And a colon. There's a good thing about friends; they never, they never let you down. Okay. So uh, all these three sentences are compound sentences joined using three different ways: a comma, a semicolon, and a colon. Yeah. So far, so good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So far, so good. Okay, so uh, now we're moving on to the complex, complex sentences. Now we're moving on to the complex sentence. A complex is complex. That means it has, contains one independent clause. I see one independent clause. That means the meaning is not complete unless we join it with another clause. Yeah. When we say independent, that uh, sorry when we say independent that means the meaning is complete and full it doesn't need another clause and two or more dependent clauses uh, what we mean by dependent clauses we mean clauses that cannot be understood yeah it can be the other way around yes samira uh, uh, clauses that cannot be understood unless we join them with an independent clause yeah okay so I have examples here. No buildings can be designed unless good engineers are employed. So no buildings can be designed. That is um, an independent clause. 
unless good engineers are employed, that's a dependent clause. Because if I say, unless good engineers are employed, the sentence, the idea is not complete. If I say, unless good engineers are employed, the sentence or the idea or, or the thought is not complete. Yeah. So no buildings can be designed unless uh, good engineers are employed. Yes, one subordinate. Well done. Yes, Samira. One subordinate. Yes, unless it's a, one of yes, one of them. If I drove a Mercedes Benz, I would be very proud. If I drove a Mercedes Benz, I would be very proud. Yeah. So again, one uh, independent clause and one dependent clause. And the third sentence is your plants die because you did not water them. Your plants die because you did not water them. Okay. Again, we have an independent clause at the beginning. And then because you did not water them, we have a dependent clause. That's a complex, a complex sentence. Okay. Yeah. So far, so good. Okay. Uh, yeah, subordinate, subordinating conjunctions are a lot, actually, and these are just some of them. I got them from this website. Yeah. Okay. Unless, until, when, whenever. It's a long list. These are just some of them. There's so many of them. And they make complex sentences. Yeah. Okay. So. Then the fourth type of sentences are compound complex sentences, combination of compound complex sentences. They contain at least two independent clauses and at least one dependent clause. At least two independent clauses and at least one dependent clause. An example of that is, though I wanted to go shopping, I made a mistake about my sister. Okay, so I shouldn't have bought. I made a mistake. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Though I wanted to go shopping, my sister decided to watch a movie. So we both enjoyed a nice movie. Okay. So though I wanted to go shopping, that's an uh, that's a dependent clause. My sister decided decided to watch a movie. That's an independent clause. Uh, so we both enjoyed a nice movie. That's another dependent clause. So it's a compound complex sentence. Yeah it has two um, dependent clauses and one single de uh, independent clause yeah that's right and the second one i finished my project but i couldn't print it as my printer was out of order again finish my project is an independent clause but i couldn't print it uh, is a dependent clause as my printer was out of order is another dependent clause. I was eating my food and enjoying it, but then I felt sick. Yeah, that's a nice one, Samira. Thank you so much. Okay, so that's a compound complex sentence. Yeah. Uh, the danger of writing, the danger of writing uh, like complex and compound complex sentences is always uh the likelihood of the students making mistakes because they want to express more than one single or two ideas in one single sentence so there is uh, and that is why i think i guess we should give it enough time and practice we give we should give it enough teaching time and practice yeah because there's always a danger of like creating run-on sentences or fragmented sentences or the ideas becoming unclear in the students writing yeah so um yeah, that is that is just an area that we have to sort of pay attention to. Okay, so uh, a question to teachers and teachers can share with me this. First, uh, language interference is that's right, an error prone. That's right. First, language interference is always um, a possibility, definitely, because um, the, most of the students, like some of my students in their first language and try to translate that in their heads into English and write it in English. So that creates like some kind of um, um, possibility and, and, you know, of making mistakes. Uh, they would say, for example, they will have like all subjects. And this is something that happens a lot. Like Sarah, she drives a beautiful Mercedes. She, you know, this is something that, that happens a lot, either a double um, a subject or double, double verb. Yeah. And run-on sentences um, 
run on sentences is, is um, another source of mistake. I enjoy riding bikes. I would ride one every day if I had time. I enjoy riding bikes and I would ride one every day if I had time. Uh, uh, of course, the sentence in, in red is not correct. If we are to correct it, uh, there are two ways. Uh, one of them is I enjoy riding bikes and I would ride one every day if I had time. I enjoy riding bikes, comma, I would ride one every day if I had time. Yeah, so um, these are just some of the um, sources of uh, the students' mistakes, missing or incorrect use of conjunctions. Though he was sick, still he sat for the exam. Uh, the correction is, though he was sick, he sat for the exam. Uh, the students use the word still, I don't know, I think it's an outcome of uh, translating, uh, you know, the meaning in their heads first, and then translating that back into English. I guess that can be um, one of the uh, reasons they make mistakes about such sentences. Yeah. That's true. That's true. I always encourage my students to write short sentences. I always encourage my students to sort of one idea, one sentence, and that's it. You know, another idea, put a full stop, and, and then carry on. Unless you get advanced students. If you are teaching academic writing to advanced students, um, and you know that they're going to need it for their essays and assignments, then it, it becomes a must. Okay, so fragmented sentences is another um, you know, um, area of weakness. Teachers who seek continuous professional development, which is very important for good teaching. So they start with an idea, and by the time they get to the second idea, to link it to the first idea, they will have forgotten about the first idea. So most likely they get carried away and, and, and have a focus on the second idea instead of the first idea. Uh, it happens a lot. It happens a lot, and and we call this kind of sentence uh, fragmented and fragmented and dangling, like it's, it's not finished yet. You know, the idea is just uptight in there, incomplete. Yes, yes, yeah. So teachers who seek continuous professional development, we should go back to the subject teachers, and what is the verb to go with that is improve the teaching. Teachers who seek continuous professional development improve the teaching. Yeah. Uh, normally, because the students have a lot to say sometimes and they have many ideas to communicate at the same time, they tend to make mistakes like that. They miss the subject of the verb. That's right. That's right. Because they have a focus on the, the last part of the sentence and forget about the first part of the sentence. Yeah, it happens a lot. It happens a lot. Okay, so. And actually, sometimes I feel for the students, you know, that sometimes you feel like um, because writing itself as teachers, we know that writing requires a lot of skills disconnected from the main clause. That's true. Yes, it requires thinking of ideas and structuring them and putting them into sentences and, you know, how, making like that conscious effort to sort of, you know, writing correct sentences and, and, and to serve the meaning they intend to serve. Yeah, so it, it's a lot of work. Writing is a lot of work, and that is why it has to have um, a lot of practice, actually. Okay, so they also need to double check their writing before submitting it. Yes, proofreading, I agree with you, Abdullah. Uh, yes, uh, proofreading is, is one of the important skills, and I think we need to train the, the students into that. Uh, students need to be trained into that because it does need training. Uh, sometimes they get carried away with ideas, they write the ideas and think that is, that's it, end of story. It is not. It's always a good idea to go back and look for mistakes, especially if they know that they have got certain weaknesses when it comes to grammar, structure, spelling, punctuation, etc. Et I always advise my students to do that. I, I advise my students to sort of, you know, when they're finished re uh, writing, that is not the end of it. They're only halfway. They should go back and read what they have written and discover their mistakes. Yeah, I think one of the ways to sort of encourage and practice such kind of skill is have them like peer uh, review, um, right? Like for example, sometimes we sometimes we have to sit down and 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 make like a, a marking scheme for them, and then uh, give them a marking scheme like for grammar, 
punctuation for spelling and ask them to either grade their own writing or, or peer check uh, writing for each other. I guess, you know, this kind of practice, classroom activities can sort of train them into um, revising their own writing before submitting the writing. Yeah, it just raises awareness that this kind of work is very important, is as important as writing itself, proofreading. Yeah, okay, so I have a task. I'm gonna work together to identify the following types of sentences. The mother laughed as she watched the baby uh, playing. Yes, I agree. Complex. Thank you, Salim. Second. One is, yeah, it's so quick, inshallah. Yes, second one, the children made beautiful uh, sand castles. Simple, that's right. Yeah. Simple. Three, I have a meeting, but I'm not prepared. Compound, yes, compound. Three is compound, that's right, that's right. Number four, she had an accident, so she called her brother who came to help her. Four, somebody do four. Compound again, she had an accident, so she called her brother who came to help her, yeah. Okay, and five, he drives an Audi and he feels proud about it. That's another compound sentence. Six, even though she speaks four languages, she finds it difficult to express herself because she's very shy. Complex. So I, I forgot to write compound complex. Okay, complex for the last one, yeah? Compound complex. There's one, sorry. Yes, that's right. Number six. Even though she speaks four languages, she finds it difficult to express herself because she is very shy. I think this is compound complex, yes. Okay, we're doing good. All right, so for teachers, for teachers, yeah, I guess, I guess it will be advisable to sort of sequence the sentence types in a scaffolded way. I mean, instead of teaching um, compound sentences before simple sentences, start with a simple sentence, like, you know, give it in bites, like give it in small little tiny bites to the students, yeah? Uh, I think teaching sentence patterns, take a, teaching takes a lot of time, I think. It takes a lot of time and practice. I guess, yeah? And it also depends on the level of the students, depends on the level of the students. So we have to we have to make like that decision as to when to introduce the sentence patterns in our teaching. And also what, which ones are most appropriate to, to the students depending on their needs, depending on their level, etc. Yeah? And I guess also we should give it time, you know, practice it long, uh, practice it much enough. Yeah. Practice it, yes, thank you, Modi. Uh, practice it much enough, I think, yeah? Especially when it comes to compound and complex sentences, they need a lot of time. They need time to simmer. They need a lot of time, yes? And we should try to make it fun because it's an area of challenge. Show examples, that's right. Yeah, show examples, that's right, yes, yes. So I guess if we make it fun, like using cut-ups and colors, and if we try to make it fun, I guess, if we have like a lot of activity inside the classroom and make it more dynamic, then I guess that would be a good idea for them to sort of um, get it. And it will help them understand it. Yeah. So we should, I think because it's an area of challenge anyway, and they might, they might sort of find it too difficult to decipher and then at some stage give up or something so i guess we should like you know use humor and, and games etc you know things like that and use of cut-ups cut-ups are really really 
food, you know, like you have uh, two pairs of, of, you have like an incomplete sentence and you have it in two halves and then they can match the halves with each other. This can make them move around the classroom, have fun, feel the challenge, uh, be interested in the work and be motivated and maybe, you know, have a sense of achievement. Uh, so cut-ups are really good, I think. Color coding, yeah, who doesn't love colors, actually? Yeah, color coding, I think. Um, I was coming to that, Samira, yes, that's right. Yes, color coding, yes, helps a lot. It does help a lot, yes. Yes, sure, yes, it does. Yeah, color coding. We, we love using colors and make things colorful. So I guess, uh, yes. And also categorization, like we've just done, which one is a simple, which one is a compound. But if we try to make it competitive inside the classroom, like have them in groups, group A, group B, group C, et cetera, or, you know, sometimes I give the groups names, sometimes funny names and sometimes nice names. So um, have them in groups and then have them categorize the sentences and make it competitive. Uh, like, let's see which group are going to do, you know, all the work and which group is going to get the full mark, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, um, that is, you know, make it dynamic, assign each group the parts of the, a part of a sentence or have it, you know, have, have them all mixed up and then they can sort of categorize the sentences into simple, compound, complex, etc., I guess, yeah? So, it will create a lot of dy uh, dynamic in, inside the classroom. It will make them feel... Mm, like they're all engaged and motivated and it will make them um, learn better, I guess, yeah, if, if it becomes competitive. Okay, so um, I guess for us as teachers, we have to have, we have to make informed decisions regarding when to introduce sentence patterns, uh, how do we start teaching that and how do we introduce that and, and, and again, I think we have to introduce sentence patterns in bytes. Yeah, in bites, I think, you know, in small bites, I think. Yes, start with simple ones. And I, I agree with you, because you said pre-teach parts of speech, because I guess, um, I guess um, if they know what a, what a subject is, what a verb is, what a, what a noun is, what a verb is, et cetera, et cetera, I think if we sort of use meta discourse to, you know, to, to teach the, about itself, I think it will help them a lot. I guess, yeah. So I guess for students to know, uh, so meta language, yes, or meta discourse, yes, yes, Salim, that's right. So if we if we we use that inside the classroom, then they will be tech, you know, use that technical language. They'll be able to know what a subject is and what a verb is, uh, and and then they'll be able to understand us when we say like a subject should come before the verb, the verb should come before the subject, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, but if we stand there, you know, talking uh, using these technical terms without them knowing that, then that is, it doesn't help them at all. Yeah, they might tell you they understand you, but they, they will not understand you. Yeah, use connections. Uh, sorry, um, sorry. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I guess parts of speech are something to start with always, always. So what I tend to do in my own teaching when I teach a new vocab word and i think i think in the book does that as well i mean unlock does it uh it doesn't help a lot Di direct direct translation does not help a lot and that is why we should encourage the use of english all the time i guess if we when we teach a new vocab i then alongside teaching the meaning and the use of it i think we should tell we should also teach the part which part of speech um which part of a speech that particular word is, if it's a verb, an adjective, a noun, etc. Yeah. And yes, I guess, you know, I, I guess as time goes on, I, I think they will start to make connections, to make connections like what an adjective looks like, maybe, you know, the, from the ending, ing, ive, etc. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, translation was a setback. I agree with you, Samira. Yeah. Um, that's all from me. That's all from. Thank you so much for all your comments and insights and reflections, and all the information. Mashallah, that it enriched um, my session, and I learned a lot from you guys. Thank you so much. Perfect audience. Mashallah, as always, uh, Dr. Samaya, very very beneficial, very inspiring uh, workshop, and we all learned from this. Um, 
hopefully if you have no questions uh, you can uh, if you have questions you can uh, write in the chat box or you can use your microphones thank you, thank you very much and uh, if you don't have any i'll uh, start posting the evaluation form please make sure when you write when you complete the evaluation form to write the exact name you wanted to appear on the certificates uh, sometimes we receive these comments saying that uh, our names are not correct etc but in fact, yes, make sure that you have the exact name that you write, you wanted to appear on the certificates. Uh, I'll start with the evaluation form, then I'll uh, add more links. So please make sure that you complete the evaluation form correctly. Thank you so much, everyone, for your kind words. And also, thank you so much, Dr. Basim. I'm honored by your presence at my presentation tonight. Thank Thanks you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot.